Okay, so Adele, let's let's start all the way back. You're from Chicago originally, is that correct? No, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, okay. Oh. We moved to Chicago when I was 11. Oh, okay. And then, um, and it was in Chicago then until I went to college. And I went to uh, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And then I went back to Chicago for graduate school at the University so, of Chicago. So what were you studying as an undergraduate? So I, I studied mathematics. Okay. Um, and uh, I was I was actually, and I, I was actually at in Ann Arbor for a total of three and a half years. So the first half of my senior year, I was um, I left in the spring to go to Europe. I was accepted at the university in Munich, and um, and and the people who were it wasn't junior year abroad, but the people uh, who were running the program were supposed to arrange housing and didn't. So when I got there, um, I spent a couple weeks looking for housing, and I said, you know, forget it. I'm going to go enjoy Europe. So um, I went all over Europe and up to England and up, you know, way north, and ended up in Israel, and then came back to the United States in the fall. And so uh, everywhere I went, there was an IBM building. And I had been pondering, what was I going to do with this math degree? Um, because originally, I was doing it to teach high school math, which is what my t mother was trained mm -hmm. to do. And, um, and I discovered when um, at the University of Michigan, to get a, a teaching certificate, you had to do a class, a public speaking class. And I wouldn't do it. It scared me. <laughs> so. Which is amazing, but Changed. I, yeah, well, in those days, I didn't think I had anything interesting to talk mm -hmm. about. It wasn't until you do something that's interesting to talk about that you can talk. So uh, I never got my certificate. So I was thinking, what was I going to do? And I saw all those IBM buildings, and I thought, wow, I could live anywhere in the world if I could learn to do something that is important to IBM. And uh, I had a cousin who was a statistician for them. Um, in New York, and he explained a little more. And I had taken already a computer class. Um, in those days, you know, we were punching cards. Um, I well, yeah. It wasn't really computers you embraced. But um, I got it in my head that I should get my bachelor's and then go get a master's degree so I'd learn more about computers. And I got a job at Michigan at the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching, mm -hmm. working with Carl Zinn who is one of the pioneers in computer-aided instruction. And um, he hired me mostly because in those days I knew how to speak German, and we were teaching German class. And it was an IBM 1500. And very straightforward programming in my mind. And I saw programming as the grandest world for problem solving. You know, it's just perfect for me. And um, so I applied for graduate school. And um, picked Chicago primarily to go home to see if I wanted to live in Chicago again. So it was sort of this go get your master's degree in, um, and it was 1967. And in 1967, um, I needed fellowship. Women just were not going into those fields, they were not getting fellowships um, until the universities realized because they're businesses and they need students, that they were going to be forced into bringing more women in because too many of the guys were getting drafted. Mm. Um, years ago, Thelma Estrin told me that she had the same experience in World War II, that she got this wonderful job at UCLA running a lab there because the guys were all off on mm. the war. And I said, it's too bad it takes a war us to get in. But, um, but I did very well, and, um, and I was encouraged to take the exams to go on for my PhD. Um, and the only, they ask you when you take your exams, well, what are you going to do your PhD in? And what I knew about was educational technology. That's what I learned um, at the end in Michigan, and it was still something interesting to me. And um, Chicago was, had mostly Atomic Energy Commission funding. They were building um, this was the, the years of Bob Fabry mm -hmm. and Maurice Wilkies used to visit mm -hmm. and they were building a um, machine they called the magic engine machine, something like that, capability based hardware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they didn't really have funding for educational technology. But one of the faculty, Roman Wheel, who's still there in the business school, um, asked Patrick Soupies, who was visiting, 
whether I could come visit him. And Patrick Soupies is the one of the two directors of the Institute for Mathematical Sciences and the Social Studies. Um, that's not right. Mathematical Studies and the Social Sciences, right? Um, and he said, sure. So I uh, was at Chicago for two years, got my master's, um, and packed up to go to Stanford, um, not as a student, but as a visiting student, mm. still a Chicago student. And um, after the first year, Chicago had accepted a proposal with no strings attached. You could be anywhere. You just had five years to get it done. And Stanford had offered me a research associate mm. position, so I didn't leave California. Yeah, so much for that, yes. So much for Chicago, <laughs> yeah. letting one, a student go away. Yeah. <laughs> well, the alternative was going back to Chicago and te continuing to teach programming, which would have, or nearly teaching programming class would be fun, and we did it in an interesting way. We did it as um, comparative programming. So the one class uh, course I taught when I was there was um, it was um, Snowball, um, PL1, and BAL. Oh, okay. So assembly language, and the way we taught it was obviously to teach you how to build the elements of one language in the other, so that in the end you could see what the language was designed for, especially, and then what it meant to um, write a language. Unfortunately, it was 1968, Chicago. And those were not happy years at the university, um, nor in the city, because um, that was the, the year of the Democratic Convention. Um, and it was a big sit-in, and my students were sitting in at the ad building, and I learned very early about the politics of universities. Mm -hmm. that, trying to protect students from themselves. Because mm. of course, at the University of Chicago, they, they didn't come to class, they were supposed to be flunked. So I negotiated to let them make up the course by a certain date and then they would be okay. Because otherwise, you flunk a class at Chicago, you might as well go home. Mm. Mm. So it was, it was an interesting, interesting experience. Time, yes. Yeah, it was interesting. And I'm not sure if, if that turned me off from, from working in university. I, I know that when I finished my degree at Stanford, my um, I did teach for a short time visiting down in Rio de Janeiro, mm -hmm. but um, but I was I I think it wasn't really a commercial versus university trade off. It was more. Alan Kay wants me to come play. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> yes. I'm going. So, so how did how did that hook up happen? Um, so the the IMSSS the institute um, had both people working in mathematics and in reading. And then uh, Richard Atkinson headed up, who became the chancellor of the University of California. Um, and um, so there were a lot of graduate students doing some very interesting and novel work, but on the big timeshare systems. And Dexter Fletcher was one of them. And he, he said, we need to get involved in the ACM. And we need to get involved in the community around us interests. We can't just be at the university. So he and I um, did two things. We went to an ACM meeting down in Anaheim, and we also uh, got involved with more of a local user group that was looking at computer uses for kids. And that, that means you're not so insular. You're not, you've got to find ways not to just be in your own building. And um, because of our community work, I met a number of people who were either going to or were already at Park. John Schock mm. was one of them. And, um, and so I think that's how Alan became aware of what we were doing at Stanford. Oh, okay. mm. And we, we were doing, um, besides teaching um, courses, we were also, I built a system in which students could study um, first order predicate logic by essentially inventing their own axiom X system, mm -hmm. which is and just to, so they know how hard it was, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that's that's a way of programming, and we were also teaching uh, logo of the Seymour Papert work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, and there was more of an assembly language level language thing was called Slogo that we were working on with kids, just trying to understand different forms of bringing computing into the classroom. So, um, so Alan became aware of, um, of our work and, as, and, and he had come to the conclusion that to understand the software for the Dynabook, you couldn't just start with adults. You're going to have to bootstrap yourself. You're going to have to start with the kids um, and see if that applied to the adults. Mm.
Okay, so that got you over to Park, when was that? Done? So that would have been um, the summer of 1973. Okay. So I had been, spent most of 1972 in Brazil, and had come back, uh, finished my degree, and, um, and, and, and went to Park at that time. And uh, I went to Park pregnant with my first daughter. <laughs> And so those beanbags were not as attractive to me as they were to other people. <laughs> Alan always said the purpose of the beanbag was so that you would sink into the beanbag and it would be hard to jump up and attack somebody when they're giving a talk. Oh, great. Which is funny. <laughs> what he didn't understand is once you sunk in and you were pregnant, you couldn't jump up. <laughs> other people had to bring you up. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Um, and I remember, I remember my uh, folks visiting and taking them there and they just were Tis tisking, you know, this isn't a workplace, you know, this is a <laughs> playground, <laughs> which it was, which and that's was. a good thing. That's okay, that. so, so talk about those first uh, few years then in terms of what you got to play with. Well, I, I remember when I got there thinking, this is too good to be true. And um, to be given such free license from a large corporation and by this time, I had spent a couple summers working for IBM, um, you know, while I was in school. And I had a, a very clear sense of large corporations and how they organized and how they ran things. And I didn't see Xerox as any different. So I was impressed with the forward thinking that gave such free hand to so many people, so many smart people. But I also felt that it wasn't going to last because when you start with nothing and you ask for a budget and with that budget you build something quite novel it's going to be hard to convince people that you've learned everything there is to learn with that novel piece of hardware and you need to recapitalize um, and it, it actually happened faster than I expected um, that you started getting more of of the tension of resource trade-offs but the first couple years, you didn't feel that way. Um, so Smalltalk 72 had been designed. And the challenge given to me was, do you think children can learn this language? How would you approach it? Again, in those days, the major influence, I mean, there was influence from what I would call um, the education world. So Benjamin Bloom, who I knew at the University of Chicago, Jerome Bruner uh, was, was somebody um, whose work and approach to curriculum uh, was very admired. But the biggest influence was um, Seymour Papert mm. and his group. And they didn't believe in curriculum. They believed that if you uh, gave somebody a toy that intrigued them, they would learn something mm. from it. I, th I think the fallacy in that is that they actually expected their, their students to learn something fundamental about mathematics, and they made such claims. But there wasn't, if they were successful, it would have been by the power of personality. And that doesn't transfer. If you're going to have broader impact in the school systems, you're going to have to give be better guidelines, and you're going to have to tie what you're doing to expectation, more so now with accountability rules than back then. But still, you had the question was always in front of you, what will the kids learn if they do this? Um, and, and since in the early 70s, programming uh, little calculators were just in the schools. You know, computers were not something everybody had their hands on. You couldn't argue the importance of just learning about what a computer is. You had, it had a tie to other curriculums. So my challenge was to balance the um, exploratory, what we would call more of an inquiry approach, which is how we think about it at the San Francisco Exploratorium where I'm, where I'm involved, with um, at least a curriculum guideline. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and as it turned out, we were quite successful, not so much because um, I had a genius idea or anything, but because the nature of the language gave us the answer, which is, if I give you something that you can play with and extend, 
even a piece of paper with a paragraph and I say it's not written well, rewrite it. That's easier than giving you nothing and say mm -hmm. make something, you know, including a blank sheet of paper and sure. starting to write. So the, the lovely part that has proven true for professional programmers as well as kids is when you start with something, an, an object that does something, and then you could put many objects like those together and have them interact, or ex and then extend and make them behave a little differently, you can take a very incremental approach to learning how to control a computer s system. Um, and we took a systems approach. It wasn't just lines and lines and lines of code the way many projects teaching programming in BASIC uh, found themselves. You, you really were mapping to their natural understanding of what were the actors in, in the application they were trying to build. So, so, so now some of that early work, I assume, was done on Altos. Now where, where did the, the Dino book, whole Dino book idea come from? And, and talk some more about when you thought that would happen and uh, you know, what you wanted that to be. So, so clearly, um, I went to Xerox to join Alan Kay's dream. Um, having spent years and years doing educational work on timeshare systems. Having spent many years uh, working with the computers and tutoring in public schools, including here in East Palo Alto, the Ravenswood School District. Um, I was not comfortable with this, edu when you're going to learn, you go to a place to learn. What I believed is, is that you have to bring your tools of learning with you wherever you are. Obviously that starts with your brain, but if computers were going to be successful in changing how we learn, and we were going to deal with lifetime learning, then they had to be with you. And in walks this wonderful man with this cardboard mock-up of a carry-it-with-you computer which didn't look so strange, you can put a calculator down, but in the schools, you know, calculators were tethered. They were locked to the desk, mm, mm. right? You didn't take them home. You didn't carry them with you. They cost too much money. Um, but we could see where it was heading, eventually. And um, so when I first learned about the Dynabook dream, it just mapped exactly into what was bothering me about the timeshare work. Um, Alan had done work in his PhD dissertation at the University of Utah, of course, on the flex machine. So he had been at it for many, many years trying to figure out how to create um, what I call this computation and communication multimedia um, device and had been mocking up a whole series of them over the years. I think there was one called the Kitty Comp, um, where the comp was a K. Um, so, but when I stepped in, he had already had this Dynabook mockup. And, and he'd go around giving talks and showing this computer and I think what people don't realize is when you give a talk with the enthusiasm with which he gave it, people thought he was marketing something he, he had. The product he had, yeah. And yeah. so we'd get letters to buy them. <laughs> and you know, you couldn't, some, some, you, you could hardly dissuade people that it wasn't real because we had it simulated on the Alto. And if for people who understood what they were listening to, it was very intriguing. But many people, as we've talked about in the past, many people just thought he was crazy, we were crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, that it would never happen, it could never happen. And nothing motivates a research team more than <laughs> to be told you can't do it. In fact, it's a way in which you get your researchers to stop thinking about what's hard and just do it because you know it's like like telling somebody in sports you can't run that fast well wait I'll show you I can do that I mean, it's the same obviously the same motivator for software people software and hardware people um, we took the altos we had the we built when I started at Xerox we were in a building uh, up on Coyote Hill not the current building and there was a basement area not being used. I think the Polos, the office group, were down there, but there was space. So we carpeted it and put up, and we put our group's altos down there. So there was kind of an allotment of altos to different groups. And, um, and then we had, um, we brought students. We, we negotiated with the school system for the 
MGM students, mentally gifted minor mm -hmm. students, um, to participate in this experience. Um, interestingly, one of those students' parents lives on my street, where I live now in Palo Alto, and they said that that was the primary influence for him to go into computing mm -hmm. later, which was, I hope he wasn't shocked to find out in those days when that wasn't what it was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure he was. Um, and we also arranged it so one of the students wanted to be the teacher. And uh, so she taught a class, Miriam, and um, these kids were having a great time um, because some of them love to paint, some of them love to dream up ideas, and if anything we learned is not everyone had a program, but that it's a great way to teach kids how to collaborate with mm -hmm. one another, mm -hmm. that everyone could have a different role. It, we didn't use the word team. We didn't use the word collaboration, but they almost naturally fell into their role of saying, well, I don't really know how to do it, but you do. Here's what I want to see. And, um, and we did a lot of that. Eventually, we op and, and on weekends, Saturdays, we'd have class for Xerox's employees' kids. Mm. Mm. And uh, that was a great way for me to meet the people in the other laboratories because, of course, we had two computer laboratories, but we also had three others, uh, chemists and physicists, and, um, and their kids came for a class. Mm -hmm. And that was fun. And that allowed them to understand more about what we were doing because otherwise you sort of wonder, what's the point? What are they spending money on? What's going on? Because it, it didn't look like hardcore science, mm -hmm. which it wasn't. So what, what years was that going on? Whoa. 1974, I'm gonna date this, you know, for, for several years. Um, the way I'm dating this will, you'll laugh, because we ended up creating a resource center at Jordan Junior High School um, and taking the altos there, mm -hmm. which was a bit of a bureaucratic struggle, but uh, I'll leave that for some other day. And, um, and I remember that I had a one-year-old, and I took her with, and we had snow in Palo Alto, and the junior high school kids were having a snowball fight. And that was like in the winter of 74, 75. Yeah. So, uh, so, so from 74 to 76. Um, Small Talk 72, which is what we were teaching at the time, was a very difficult language to teach. I understand the motivation behind it, but basically, um, it had the core idea of objects were sent messages, but an object could decide to gobble up the message stream. So depending on each token in the message stream, something different could happen, yeah. which meant that you really had to mentally think through the implementation yeah. to know what was being said in the code. You just, it wasn't easy to read the yeah. code. And uh, you know, out of that experience, I remember begging <laughs> that we don't, we don't allow that mm. um, because because you could gobble it up and evaluate, gobble it up and take it as is. I mean, there were all different ways mm. of gobbling it up, and it depended on what the implementation mm. of the message was and the gobbling. Yeah. And you know, adults, professionals have problems with that kind of language. It was beautiful because it was very iconic, very. And there was a lot of research going on at the time on iconic programming. David Canfield Smith's mm -hmm. Pygmalion was done. It was one of the first uh, languages for for just expressing what you want to have happen with imagery. Um, not not good solutions to the complexity of no screen space, however. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right. So so, so then then I guess maybe talk about the, the the sort of the the changes that went on in small talk deriving from from that. So the different versions. In, there was a small talk 72 which had that characteristic. Yeah. Um, very small system. Uh, and very all, the graphics was very oriented to line drawing. Mm. It was the turtle metaphor from Logo. We had Myrtle the turtle, and that was a little icon. Um, and so that was fun for the kids for, uh, for learning to draw. But, but limiting, very limiting. And um, so in parallel to language design, there was a lot of work on painting systems and animation systems and music systems to be integrated. So we kind of did them in parallel and figured out um, how to merge. 74 was a new implementation. We'd started out on data general novas. Um, 
programming BCPL. So I think the Alto initially what emulated BCPL. Mm -hmm. So the small talk byte codes would then be interpreted. Um, so there was a new implementation uh, in 74, and then in 76 there was a new language, which essentially did away with this gobbling. Mm -hmm. um, still had the, I the icons. And um, it was in Smalltalk 76 that Dan Eagles did the first bitlet, mm. which is the block transfer of mm. bits, which is the underlying um, uh, system code for, for, making, for being able to manipulate the bits on a bitmap display. Um, that bitmap display was supposed to be a simulation of what we thought would happen in a flat panel display, but it took a life of its own. Um, things like that happen. I, I always say to people when they're fretting about some project they're going to do or some new job they're going to do, quit worrying about failure. Failure's easy. Worry about if you're successful because <laughs> then you have to deal with it. Um, and and Smalltalk 76 is where um, there was some history but uh, some very beautiful examples of galley editing uh, mm. was done. Diana Mary did some uh, wonderful um, implementations of a galley editor that mixed the text and pictures. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were going to have a big demo on a Dorado with some corporate people. So we wrote a text that described essentially how paper flowed through a copier duplicator. We were starting to get the idea that we better figure out how to explain what we're doing less in educational terms and more in how it would benefit the corporation. Something I think would have been good to start with, but Hindsight is so smart. Um, and, and, um, and I did an animated sequence of the paper flowing. So you, you could actually see the still frame all labeled to so look like a still one. And we just shocked them when we hit a run button. Mm. And I think the one we surprised the most was, was a park guy, was Bob Spinrad. You know, he was quite surprised by it. And, um, and that was very, um, that, that felt good, you know, to have a little surprise. Uh, we did you, in you mentioned Dorados in there. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? When did so, that come in? so basically, after the Alto, there was a series of hardware designs done in the computer science lab. Uh, Alan's group with me in it were in the system science lab, and our manager was Bert Sutherland. And then in the computer science lab, the initial manager was Jerry Alkine, with um, Bob Taylor as sort of associate head. I, I'm not sure what his title was exactly. Frankly, given his history at ARPA and funding at ARPA, I think everyone deferred to him more as the head, and Jerry more as the liaison from corporate, and Jerry had come from Volt Bear, Nick, and Newman. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, um, so they built uh, first uh, a dolphin, um, and then, uh, then the Dorado, and then the dandelion, which became the uh, hardware system for the Star Workstation, mm -hmm. which was announced in 1981. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of machines being designed from 1972 mm -hmm. up, you know, in the short amount of time. Um, and and it, it, because we weren't getting recapitalized too easily, one of the things we discovered is you could take all your altos and sell them to somebody else within Xerox. And you didn't get real money, you got credits, and with that you could get the ah. next machines. Ah. And at, the same, at that same time frame, because other divisions were getting the machines, Xerox Special Information Systems Group down in Pasadena um, had gotten dolphins as well and were experimenting with small talk. I didn't find that out until um, more like 1980, 1979, mm. 1980. And it plays a significant part of, of the future of how things played out. The other hardware system that was a follow through was a note taker. So this is where we collaborated with Doug Fairburn and designed um, you could call it a portable, I called it a luggable. Luggle, yeah. And it wasn't physically that different, you know, in terms of size than the, uh, the Adam Osborne machines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you could carry it with you, lug lug, put it under the seat and coach. I understand that you couldn't do it in first class, it was apparently too tight. And Larry Tesler did that. It had batteries, it had um, dual process 68,000s mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. uh, one of them managing the bitmap display. What we were trying to do was move closer and closer to the Dynabook, the Dynabook idea yeah. while the other 
machines were getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. I mean, a Dorado, you needed a that. Yeah, air yeah. conditioning for that yeah, yeah. echo machine. And, uh, and I remember um, in 1977, uh, in 1976, the small talk system uh, really pushed more to have a, a class hierarchy. So objects were described in terms of a class of objects, then you created instances mm -hmm. of the class. Um, those were the really the active objects. But we were aiming towards a system that, that was, everything was an object, which meant a class would be an object too, and you could send messages to it. Um, so that was the, that would be, um, mostly information and act actions shared across all instances. And um, so there would be a class hierarchy where you would say, oh, I, I'm, a, I'm a traveling vehicle just like that one, except I'm different in this following way and I can be different in how I implement something or I can have more properties and, and understand other things. And you can imagine, you know, the typical business example would be there are accounts, there are bank accounts, but there are special bank accounts. Right. Um, so we had this whole thing laid out, and it was very compelling because it fit right into the curriculum ideas for how to teach kids. Mm. Give them a starting point mm. and really help them learn how to, how to refine it. And we were really exploring this programming by refinement and really seeing a whole new software engineering process where you it programmed iteratively. You started out with a prototype and you kept changing it and, and working it until it was what you wanted and then you started figuring out where performance uh, it could be improved. Um, and in 1977, there was a great need to teach the executives, top 10 executives of Xerox, about what we were doing at Park. This was an initiative started by Bob Taylor, I believe, or someone in the computer science lab, where the chairman and president and the top 10 guys were invited to spend a couple days at Park to learn. And what we, what they want, what the idea of what they should learn is about modularity. Well, I think the, the powerful idea they were trying to be taught is a piece of hardware changes depending on the software that's loaded into it. It's a very obvious idea today, but not in those days. Um, the combination hardware-software, that was the package, that was the product. Um, and, and instead of saying, we built this general purpose piece of hardware, and it could be whatever you, whatever you want it to be. And they had not been very successful, I think, in um, getting enthusiasm for text editing. The, the chairman at the time, McCulloch, Peter McCulloch, had come to Park for a big demo of the Bravo text editor mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. Charles Simone had done. And when Bob Flagel, who worked for me, saw, saw McCulloch the next week at corporate, because he was there for some social service project, and he said, well, what did you think? And McCulloch said, I don't think I've ever seen any, I've seen a man type so fast. He missed the point. And, and, and this, this particular problem went on and on and on where, where we didn't know enough about how, how our customers, internal customers thought, and they didn't have a particular mission for us that they could grab their questions around. So because there was no business plan, mm. it, was, it was hard. I mean, it was just so hard. How, how, did, how did Park get funded in the first place? I mean, it's pretty far away from corporate headquarters. Yeah, I, I think the um, instigation was um, Jack Goldman. Uh, Dr. Goldman was the chief scientist. Mm -hmm. And I believe he made the case for a computer industry coming in. Mm -hmm. Um, the Xerox vision, which was actually then and now a perfectly reasonable one, which is taking information from one form and turning it into another form, basically the copy or duplicator distribution model, where the origination could be paper or it could be electronic, um, you know, the office of the future. And Jack had that idea. He hired George Paik out of um, the 
Washington University of Washington, Washington, Washington University, St. Louis, St. Louis yeah. um, a renowned physicist. They wanted to be near a university, and they explored lots of them and picked Stanford mm -hmm. at a time when government funding was mm -hmm. low, and when quite a number of um, respectable, fabulous researchers who were used to getting ARPA money were no longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, able to get the money, um, coming out of Berkeley, coming out of Stanford, coming around. And uh, they hired Bob Taylor, who knew them all from the ARPA community. Um, but they didn't, they didn't start a culture of teaching all those people what, what Xerox was all about. What they said, which wasn't unreasonable, but, but, but wasn't good for the company, what they said was, work on anything that you think in five years could have an impact on the company. Mm. And they did, and mm. they were successful. And they did the, the ethernet, sure, yeah. color copiers, uh, high-end printers, all made a big difference in the company. The problem is that the thing that everyone remembers the most was a computer. And the company wasn't prepared to be in the computing business. They did buy a big computer company, mm. SDS, um, but no one at Park was involved in that and wanted to be involved in that. Um, and um, I don't know if that was an issue because I wasn't involved in it. Uh, but I know in 1977 when we taught the class, and they asked, they asked Alan's group to do the hands-on laboratory. Mm -hmm. So I designed an a event-driven simulation system where they could simulate copier duplicator centers, mm -hmm. um, putting in the data themselves, and everyone could create something different, and they could look at each other's machine and see something different going on. And it was at that class where I found out the president of Xerox had been at IBM and knew how to program. <laughs> so, you know, little different than we knew. Um, and I think ultimately it, was a, it went over very well, but they still didn't have a business plan. Mm -hmm. In 1978, when the note taker was designed, um, again, it was Smalltalk 76 running on this smaller machine. We had the idea that, aha, this is perfect, because not by now we know two problems that Xerox has that we actually have a solution for. And um, Alan had gone on sabbatical, and I was acting manager, and then he didn't come back, and I became the manager. And, um, And I remember going back east and meeting the people who were responsible for Xerox's manuals. And these guys were amazing, what they were doing, because they drove the manual design from database, inventory database. And then they had mechanical translation into multiple languages where they essentially had negotiated what was French and what was Spanish <laughs> to be useful in all of South America. Canadian mm. French as well as the French French. And they had a technique for idiomatic expression um, um, oh. that allowed them to do the translations. And so we said, what, what problem do the tech support guys have? Because Xerox was getting a quality um, problem mm. with the customers. A tech support guy would go in to fix a copier. And he wouldn't know how. He needed, he needed to look something up in the manual. And the only way he could do it was to go out to his car, open his trunk, and read this huge set of books that weren't up to date. Obviously weren't up to date. But they had the database. They knew they could have. We said, you can dynamically do that. We can put all those books on a little computer. You can, he can carry it in. He can lie on the floor looking at stuff and looking at the diagrams on our little computer. We have this bitmap display. And I'm afraid they thought we were crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we even said, you, could, you know, maybe somebody could help us and we'd hook it up to the, by this time the duplicators had uh, little ethernets inside mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. We could just hook up and have a, di have a diagnostic uh, tool. Either we didn't express ourselves very well or, um, or they just didn't understand. It was a very big disappointment. Mm -hmm.
Well, so that for was what one. it's worth, we had some similar experiences at Bell Labs about that same time with the same piece of the world. Yeah. In terms of maintenance, yeah. So that was one of our runs. At the same time, and Larry Tesler and I did that. And the other thing he and I did is, for some reason, we were invited onto uh, a planning group of the Xerox Publishing Group. And Larry recommended on demand publishing. And this was a group that was really quite innovative because they were looking to publish videos and they were doing all the sales support. And I remember taking sales, Xerox sales training at Leesburg. I mean, we got ourselves involved. We said we have to be more involved. But um, they too didn't think that on demand publishing was a very good idea. And it's taken till now. I mean, yeah. it's taken a long time. Mm -hmm. We were always so far ahead of you know, the market. We ne needed to figure out how to get to the market. So in 19, so we had Smalltalk 76, it still had unusual characters. We had given lots of demos, we were giving talks, and XSIS from Pasadena had brought the CIA in, mm. and it turned out they were doing a project with them to invent a whole new approach, for, uh, workstation approach for analysts. And they were doing it all in small talk. And I remember going, um, it was a combination of people at Langley and at NPIC, which is the National Picture Interpretation yes. Center. Uh, yeah. And I remember meeting this gentleman who um, was by profession a photographer. And he showed me this prototype that they had been working on. And the first thing that floored me was, I thought they were supposed to tell us when they took our research and started doing something with it. <laughs> but the real thing that floored me was there were no books, there was no documentation, there were, there were talks. And in those talks, we would say, if you want to know how to do something, you just look and read the code. And it pretty much self-documents. I mean, we were so full of ourselves. <laughs> and you know, we just interrupt. And I said to him, Whoa, wait a minute. It was a different user interface. Um, ultimately, it was the very first spreadsheet where the spreadsheet was an object and all the cells were objects, mm. and therefore a cell could be a spreadsheet. Mm. In those days, they didn't have that. Mm. And uh, it was all hooked to a database, and it was all getting you know, CIA data coming down. And, um, and it was a remarkable tour de force. Mm. And I said to him, I don't understand how you did that. I mean, I just couldn't believe this non-professional. He said, well, I'll show you. And so I said, okay, hit control C, which is how you then get into the code and interrupt it. And I, I remember saying to him, that is the ugliest piece of code I've ever seen. And he said, oh, that's okay, because it does what I want it to do. And the professionals down at XSIS are, are gonna rewrite it all. This is the spec. Suddenly the prototype became sure, the yeah. spec, yeah, yeah. and it didn't matter how, what mattered was what. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I talk about learning from your customers. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the beginning of my getting interested in having customers. Mm -hmm. Alan never wanted to have the customers customer because you have to support them. Yes, yes. And if you support them, you're gonna do what they need and not what your vision is. I'm sure to this day he is livid angry with me um, because I marched down a software engineering row, row and got customers. But we, were, we weren't stuck, we just needed more ideas, we needed yeah, yeah. more participants. Yeah. And then, uh, so, so then that's about the time, small talk 80 time, right? Yeah, but small talk, yes, it was almost small talk 80 time. It was time for the next language. And the question was, um, how, far, how far would we push the uniformity? Mm. I wanted to do more on non-proprietary Xerox mm. processors. I wanted to understand, if you're gonna have a language of this type, did you need special hardware? There was actually an assumption that you did. Um, and I just didn't feel that we would learn that unless we brought in outside computers. Mm -hmm. This is also the time of the Sun um, Microsystems startup. Yeah, sure. Huh. So Andy had done the work at Stanford. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was one of the earliest purchasers, mm -hmm. and I got the money by selling off 
<laughs> all of our machines, all of our, you know, Xerox <laughs> machines. And I know, I mean, I wasn't a pariah, but I know, because Bill Spencer, who by this time was in charge of Park, would come and tell me, they're, they're, uh, they're breathing down my neck again about my letting you buy those machines. I said, but you know the answer. We, we can't just let the world go by us. We need to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we need to know if the software we're doing will run on these, run well on these machines, or whether we need to do special processors. And at the same time, the uh, small talk on a wrist machine, this park was sure, being done. Yeah. It was at Dave Patterson and Dave yeah, Unger sure. at um, Berkeley was going on. So um, I got it into my head that we should do the next round of small talk in a participatory manner, more like what, what you'd all know as open source. Mm -hmm. Smalltalk in, in the flavor of the code was always there is open source in that regard, but, um, but it wasn't being built by a community. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Bert Sutherland was my manager, and I said, I don't want us to do all this work without permission, because I think this time we need to publish everything. Mm -hmm. Um, Alan had his hand slapped when, in the early 70s, um, help me with the name, uh, who did the Whole Earth Catalog? Oh, Stuart Brand. When Stuart Brand came into Park and um, there was a book, Cybernetics 2, half of it was about the, um, the, the secret company mm -hmm. and he had pictures of Park in the, and so there had been publicity that had, guess, hadn't been properly signed off on. And so there had been a bit of a, you don't get to publish for a while, period. Mm. And, um, and I think Alan took it too seriously. Mm. Mm. You know, he didn't like having his hand slapped, but um, I, we did start publishing again more in, in the 76 time frame, uh, including the personal dynamic media paper that uh, Alan and I did mm, yeah. for, I tr for the computer software, I IEEE. But um, I wanted to go to corporate and ask for permission. And um, it was a little risky, because you didn't know what would come back. There's no reason for them to say yes. Um, lucky for me, between the time I suggested it and actually asking, um, Xerox's venture group had bought a lot of equity in a little fledgling computer company that wasn't doing very well called Apple Computer. Oh. And, um, and they had arranged for um, the Apple executives and then later the Lisa programming team to come for a visit. And I kind of parlay that into, well, you're willing to give, give it away. You're not interested. And I wrote this motivator about why we should be able to publish it all. And because we were planning to write a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were planning to have this community implementation um, event. And um, I think it went to one of the principal at the venture group, who then asked Jeff Rulifson his opinion. Jeff was on some special leave from Park to corporate, and he wrote the, oh sure, publish all this. So I had it on paper. Uh, 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 safe. And, uh, and so then with Bert's help, we enlisted Tektronics, Hewlett Packard, DEC, and Apple, but not Intel wanted to do it. But the rule was you must have an internal software team mm -hmm. that works with your hardware team because the question we were asking wasn't do you like the language. The question we were asking is, is there anything about hardware that would make for a better perform make for better performance? Mm -hmm. And then we worked with um, the folks at Berkeley and with Elliot Moss at UMass so, and Ralph Johnson in Illinois. But basically the initial release then went out and um, we ended up with a spec for the implementation mm -hmm. of what was Smalltalk 80. Mm -hmm. So of course we were forced into uh, straight standard ASCII because not everyone was going to have uh, control over their fonts who yeah, couldn't sure. have now they would, but back then they didn't, so that we could have all these special characters. Um, and I don't know that the special characters were all that important. They did give a, a fun flavor for sure, the yeah. kids, but um, Smalltalk 80 then, we tried to write as one book, and it, 
with the whole team, and that didn't work. But we had nice write-ups on uh, Steve Weyer's Find It, which was one of the very first efforts to explore, can you find things, browse and find things, information on an electronic book versus mm -hmm. a hard book. Mm -hmm. He did that as his PhD in the education school at Stanford. Um, we had all the work going on with constraint-based programming, Thing Lab at Al Borning's mm -hmm. thesis. Um, and we had uh, later the alter alternate reality kit. We were still still doing these educational systems. Laura Gould and Bill Fenzer, Fenzer were doing the uh, rehearsal world, mm -hmm. where if you want to understand what an object did, you had a stage and you rehearsed mm -hmm. the objects. and, mm -hmm. and and through the rehearsal, essentially evolved yourself to the programming. Um, constantly looking to see where the language wasn't strong enough, where just adding objects to the library wasn't going to be strong enough, because you'd have these trap doors into C programming mm -hmm. or lower level programming. Um, and we tried to write, I think, too much. And um, finally, what we decided to do was that Dave Robson and I would write and we would split it up into three books, four books, four books, three came out. Three came out. A yeah. language book that Dave and I would do, a user interface book that no one wanted to do, so I did, because um, it was more like a user manual. Mm. Um, a book on implementation, the experience of all the everybody else, so that was edited by Glenn mm -hmm. Krasner. And then there was going to be an applications level book, which was basically the model view controller mm. um, metaphor. And, uh, and in order to get the language book done, we kind of organized ourselves so that Dan Ingalls and I would make this, we'd, we'd have an aspect of the system we need to agree on, like, what would be the collection classes? How would you, how would you provide collections? And um, I had run a group at Park that did APL, and I was fascinated by it. So we actually had a lot of the APL stuff in it as a result. But um, we'd go to the group, we'd have this plan, we'd have a big debate. And then if you thought you weren't heard, you went to Dave as the ombudsman, and he'd listen. And if he thought you had value, he'd come to me and Dan, and he'd say, listen, you guys, you were screwing up. You didn't, you didn't listen. It was a very interesting organizational mm -hmm. dynamics, mm -hmm. because Dave never came to us. So at some point, I said, this is going too well. Nobody's complaining. This is a group that has opinions. Not a lot of them, but they have opinions. Are you, what's going on? Are you not telling us? He said, no, no one comes to him. I said, why not? He says, because they know they'll never get through me. The goal is to get done. So this is like a very different model than our previous history where, where um, uh, it, was a sm it was a smaller effort. This was a much bigger effort. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it got us involved with the world mm -hmm. in, in a mm -hmm. really, fun, really fun way. Um, and I think when the book, the book came out in 1983, that's how long it took. Yeah, it took a out. long time. And um, both as a seminal book in object-oriented mm -hmm. language, the structure of the book, which um, I really feel good about the quality of that, the, the fun doing the artwork, oh, yeah, sure, uh, yeah. which was great fun. Bob Flagel and I did the artwork. You know, and I, I realize now when you're a, uh, you want to be an artist, but you'll never be an artist. But it's your book, and you and get book, to do you it. You do what you want. You yes. do what you want. Yeah. Um, you could, you get to do that. Um, when it came out. I think it took a lot of people by surprise. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons why we managed to do it was that Xerox had built the new building, um, which has, you know, it's like a three layer building yeah, yeah. with pods, and there, are th there were three of them, and they were going to add a fourth. And, and they asked John Seeley Brown's group to go to a different building. They essentially were pushing him out. And I went and looked to see where they were pushing him to, and I thought, well, this is a great building. Who wants to hang around in all that noise? So I said, can I go too? And, um, and I was advised not to do that. It was politically not good. Mm -hmm. But it meant we had quiet. We were mm -hmm. left alone, and, um, and we could get it done. Mm -hmm. Plus, in lunchtime, we had a little band. Mm -hmm. And we, okay. we didn't play very well, but there was no one there you know, to complain. <laughs> so we got to play music. And, um, and we, so we were able to get it done. 
And of course, that was life changing for me. Um, when we got it done, um, we had a language now that other people were going to use. Other people had opinions about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, eventually it went to standards work, eventually because it was commercialized. Um, and but it was a great time to say, okay, we've plateaued. We've been trying to solve this problem about personal computing. We made a contribution that wasn't the problem we were trying to solve. And, um, and we turned to ask questions about the interpersonal computing. Mm -hmm. And that was when I asked, um, could we, bi when, by this time I was a research laboratory manager. And I asked, could I build the rest of the lab up in Portland, Oregon? Because by this time we knew all these people oh, sure, all around, all yeah. around yeah. who were already enmeshed in the culture. Um, and so we built the very first 24-hour, essentially virtual lab mm. with video conferencing, which, um, which spurred the CSCW work uh, in collaborative systems, mm. which has still intrigued me still to this day. I mean, those problems aren't mm. solved yet mm. either type stuff. But it was, it was the transition. And then um, by 1986, we had the CIA as such an important customer. Xerox was not going to do anything to commercialize. They, were de they wanted to deploy. We had done implementations on 68,000 base machines. We had a 68,000 base plugin mm. to Xerox personal computers um, that the guys down in the Dallas Development Center had done. And, um, and they weren't going to service it. And I just mm. thought, you can't do this. You can't do this to a research group. Yeah, right. Mm. You have to transfer it or not. So we asked, um, is somebody going to do something with this? And if not, here's a business proposal for a spin out. Now, I'm going to make it sound very simple, because it took 13 months of negotiation. <laughs> but um, at that point, we decided, a small group of us decided to spin out mm. a separate company. And that's how Park Place Systems mm. came about. Mm. With the deal, I mean, we had a business plan where the CIA would be less than 10% of our business, and we were always able to maintain oh, that. Okay. And nobody, nobody but me ever had clearances. Mm. So it met everybody's needs, yeah. because the government wanted commercial off the shelf. Sure, yeah. So it was perfect. You yeah, know, yeah. there wasn't a problem there. And they went to, we started Uppsala in 1986 mm -hmm. in the ACM. You know, I was president yeah, of ACM. Were, I was going to ask you about that. You should talk to them about the ACM involvement at some point there. Yeah. And, um, and so they, the CIA would come to the trade show and show everything they were doing. It was, it was okay. not black, which, you know, people felt pretty good yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is how I learned. Never think about what you're going to do in terms of God, what will happen if we fail? Failure is easy. The problem is, if you succeed, what have you, what have you, you brought have on yourself? You have to support it, yes. Yeah. Well, you, well, but you have a big deal. You know, we, we built a large company around the world, and a big community of companies around the world. And that's a lot. That's a lot to take on. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> I, I mean, some of the folks who did some of the original Unix work had some of the same issues, because, um, they love to see their stuff get used, but they didn't really want to be in the, the uh, uh, game of supporting it. Yes. Okay. And see, I think, I think that's not possible. I think yeah. that products are successful when, um, when there's passion around the product, when you've done something that you're interested in, you care about. And <clears throat> to, to just say somebody else should do it, um, it may be good, it may be bad, but it might not be what you want. But I don't think that is the message you want to give to the commercial sector. They want to know that the people who were the inventors cared about it. Mm. And I think that we had plenty of co competition, other small talk systems, mm. other companies. Um, but I think that uh, the fact that we carried that aura of we were the we were the core team. Mm. We weren't all. There were plenty who still stayed at Park, mm. they, you know, who really were more researchers. Um, but we were a core team of people who, who they could trust the ideas in. And when you're doing libraries, and this was true in the Unix world too, when you're doing libraries that people depend on, um, they have to believe in you to have oh, taste. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and, and of course there were very few people from, the research team who joined up. 
It's just that the Dallas Development Center guys moved to Palo Alto. Mm. Uh, Alan Schiffman came from uh, Schlumberger. Mm. Uh, we had 25 people in the company before we had finished the negotiation for exit mm -hmm. because the president of Xerox yeah. said, yes, you can do this, get started. Yes. So, so now had there been previous spin-offs or th there were certainly things that in effect became spin-offs but not real, I'm thinking of PostScript. There know. was no previous spin-off and there was no subsequent oh spin-off. But let me say that more clearly. There were no previous or subsequent venture-backed spin-offs. Previously, there had been some joint uh, ventures. 50-50 spectra, mm. spectra physics mm. uh, was one. There were several more out of the physics group. Um, what you're thinking about was the formation of Adobe, but that wasn't a spin-off. That oh, was people who just departed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they based their technology on technology they licensed from Evans and Sutherland. So PostScript comes from there mm. and not from the zero. Mm. It's my understanding. Um, and uh, uh, there, was, there was a company formed to, to make the mouse. There was uh, a company formed to make the altos. In fact, I was um, going through materials recently and found a nice letter from the man who headed up that company when he years later saw my picture in Forbes. Mm. Um, so there were lots of these companies, but they weren't Xerox companies. Um, <clears throat> when we were trying to spin out, Xerox had an innovation board that you went to and you presented to. They were responsible for saying, oh, you have an idea. We, we would know if there's anyone in the company. If not, we'll make a decision. So that's how we got such a quick decision. Mm. Um, and we negotiated for that time period uh, kind of the cost to Xerox so that translated into equity that the uh. venture group had. Uh -huh. But um, after us, they, the venture, the Xerox Venture Group essentially was solely funded from Xerox and they were told no more. Mm. What, whatever they made, they can reinvest, but they, it wasn't, they weren't gonna do any more. Mm. Mm. They, had, um, they had funded things like Shugart that Xerox then bought mm -hmm. and that was kind of a trade between Apple and Shugart, I think, mm. I'm not 100% sure. Um, after that, there were a bunch of companies that you would say, well, those are spin-outs. So um, is my understanding, every one of them, Xerox retained an 80% ownership in. Mm. So um, there was a whiteboarding company. Mm -hmm. There was a virtual rooms company that uh, eventually I think Microsoft bought. Mm. Um, and there were some ones that didn't make it. Uh, I guess the whiteboard company didn't make it either, although it's a great idea. And there are other companies that do it. And, uh, but those were not what I would call venture-backed. Sure, yeah. The employees didn't have enough equity for this valley to, to, to keep to, them to interested. It, yeah. Yeah. No, it wouldn't work. Mm. So we actually left Xerox in, um, I know the exact date, it would be March 18th, 1988. It was the day we signed all the papers with everybody. And it was also complicated because the Fuji Xerox in Japan had rights to any commercialization. Oh, yeah. So they became our partner mm. in Japan. And uh, the reason I know the dates is I know the date that Apple sued Hewlett Packard and Microsoft. That was March 17th, oh, the okay. St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and I had a board member, an old friend of yours, Ben Wagbright, who said to, had said to me, Adele, when we finally exit, um, I think it's important that we have an article in the Washington Post. And I said, but Ben, those are always little pictures of little birds and stuff, you know. He said, no, I, you should have your picture in there. And, uh, and he got his wish because there was an article about the lawsuit and how Xerox oh, had yes, just spun. Yes, it was yes. just a very coincidental situation, oh, hmm. but he got his wish for his little article. It's very <laughs> funny. You know, you never know. <laughs> you please people, you don't even know. You never know, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, all right, well, so that was certainly a shift to running a company. Talk about that experience, because that's different than hanging out, having a good time in a research lab. Yeah, <laughs> and with some hindsight, it may have not been the best thing to have done. I mean, no, I'm just teasing. Um, so I had a number of options in the early 80s. Um, 
um, I had been the editor and I had gotten myself involved in ACM mm -hmm. and I had been on the special interest group governing board. And that came about because when I was at Stanford, one of my Stanford colleagues had encouraged getting involved with ACM as an obligation. Mm -hmm. So I started out more with the, com the special interest group on computer uses in education. I went to a meeting, the chairman of the SIG board. Um, I met him, he, and he was local here in Palo Alto, and he asked me for lunch and asked me if I'd come on the board. And I said, I bet you you don't have any women on your board. And he said, that would be correct. And I said, you're asking me because you want a woman on your board. And he said, that would be correct. And I said, I'm going to say yes because you were honest. Yeah. And, uh, and it was great fun because I met a lot of people in different mm -hmm. fields. And you got to learn more about all the computer science specialties that you don't, unless you go out, you don't you, always you, get right. to touch all that's that. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and Addison Wesley, there was they, oh, a lot of them had written books with Addison Wesley, and he, they used to take them all out to dinner and, and wine and dine, so I'd be invited. And I'd say, you know, I'm not one of your authors. I don't have to come. But then when we went and did the books, I knew the, uh, yeah, I knew the publishers, and they had it in. They were mm. smart. Mm. Um, in 82, I became the national secretary. Oh, no. So in 79, I became the editor-in-chief of Computing Surveys. surveys. Yeah and off of the SIG board, because I went on to the Publications Board. So I learned a lot about computer science, academic politics, mm. reconfirming um, how much more fun it was at Park. Mm. Um, there's just so much more to being a professor than teaching a class and doing your research. And, um, and then I um, did that till 82, became the National Secretary. When the president was David Brandon, he had been the chairman of the SIG board. Mm -hmm. And then I um, became president at a time when ACM was having financial issues, mm -hmm. where what they were budgeting to spend was an excess of the revenue coming in. And for some reason, they didn't understand, <laughs> that's easy, you just don't spend it. <laughs> but um, they, they needed to relook at their finances. And it's funny, because I was the second female president. Before me was Jean Samet. A decade before, she coped with exactly the same problem. She came in really to, to worry about cleaning up. And I don't know why. Um, you know why other people didn't do it, or it's coincidental, mm. right? Um, but we had brought a new executive director in, and we, we did some organizational changes. So I got some, vol I learned what happens when you have a lot of people working for you who you can't fire because they're volunteers. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. What you really have to do is figure out how to engage them in good projects, how to get rid of projects that really were not going anywhere, um, and um, you know how to leverage that positive. So I was getting some very good organizational mm. learning. Um, I'd had some other offers, start a research center for one of the computer companies, um, and I felt like the book was just coming out. I was president. That was enough. And and we and I had this new lab when we were going to build the sure. Portland lab. That was a handful. You know, I had kids at home. That was a lot. And, um, but I think that ending up in business was not something I gave, you know, gave deep thought to. Mm -hmm. It was like I knew we had something important that, was, that met the goal of empowering people, that we didn't understand enough about what this did to empower people, and we really needed to learn. And the only way was to just get out there commercially. Yeah. And what was kind of nice, because I was ACM president in down years, was uh, a bunch of the guys who were part of this implementation, Glenn Krasner, who, who became vice president of engineering at Park Place, but was an uh, engineering manager at Park, and, uh, and people from Tektronix and people from other companies, they had lunch one day working on the implementation and said, we should start a conference. And so Glenn came to me and said, we want to start this conference. And I said, well, we have a little problem. 
One problem is the budget cycle for conferences is gone. This should be a SIG plan conference, and the budget cycle is over. It's already over now. Another problem is that, the, that ACM doesn't really have money to spare, so we can't lose money. So I'd have to watch over you very tightly that you didn't, you didn't lose any money. He said, well, that would be OK. How do we do that? I said, well, instead of your grand scheme of having 1,200 people at this first <laughs> conference, how about we plan for 600? And, um, and then if it looks like it's going to be more, we'll, you'll increment it. We'll just run double budgets. So they, they agreed to do that. And I said, well, the president has a little slush fund. So I can do this as an ACM, not a, not a SIG conference, as long as you agree that the next year it becomes a SIG conference if the SIGs, SIG plan and SIG soft wanted to take we'll it, do it, which of course they did. Because there were 1,200. <laughs> <laughs> it was, in a, you know, it, it's now transitioning into a, a new kind of conference, but it's still running and still mm -hmm. very popular. And it's been a, a great forum because from the outset it was a great mixture of commercial and, right. and academic. academic, you know, and a nice way to share. Um, so the OO experience, because we were educating the commercial sector, had a really important relationship to the academic because you had to change what was being taught. Um, you had to provide trainers, tutors, mm -hmm. you know, into the companies. Um, we were targeting COBOL programmers because they were the right ones. They understood the sure. business. Yeah, 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 right. And we had to convince the companies to retrain them. And that was, it was actually pretty straightforward in this country, but in Asia it was really an exercise, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, to do that. I, I remember giving lots of talks on that topic alone. Um, so the conference was, was good. I actually ended up chairing the 1987 one. I was, I was past president and I wasn't mm. doing much as past president. Um, you know, professional societies are a really critical part mm. of the um, computer industry. Whether it's IEEE, uh, Computer Society, or ACM, yeah. it, whether it's standards work or these conferences, yeah. Yeah. these forums for communication. Um, it's all the journals, it, and I was lucky. I got to taste all of that. So it taught me some things, but it didn't teach me how to deal with venture capitalists. <laughs> it did, you know, raising the money, that was hard. That was a whole new thing. Um, I was fortunate to have a good mentor in um, uh, a gentleman in the Xerox Venture Group who basically believed in what we were doing. Unfortunately, after the f we started the business and a year later, he. Yeah. He died suddenly. Oh, no. So I, I think for me that was a bit of a loss because um, he was one of the few people I felt pretty, uh, pretty able to talk through all the politics mm -hmm. with because mm -hmm. he was kind of fascinated with the whole thing anyways. And um, you know, in the end people ask me, well, was it because you were a woman? Was it harder? And I go, no. No, I don't think so. I think it's just as hard for the guys. Um, but I think they laugh it off faster. So you just have to realize that the, the, the ridiculous questions you sometimes get asked, not always, but sometimes get asked, as in, what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> and as you well know, thank goodness I was driving a eight-cylinder black T-top Mustang at the time, uh, was the right answer, because it was fast. <laughs> it was powerful. And somehow or other, that was the psychology they were looking for. I mean, it was kind of funny. Or they'd ask, what were the conversations you had at the dinner table? And I said, thanks to my father, I know everything there is to know about the Teamsters Union from management's perspective. <laughs> but it's not the same as what they were expecting. You know, I mean, they just, they were trying to figure out what you knew uh, type stuff. But, um, but it's hard work to have a company. It's mm. day in, day in, yes. out, and it's, mm. it's a lot. And I think I could have... I had a little easier time of it <laughs> mm. in the in the uh, 80s and 90s if I hadn't done that. But at the same time, I learned an awful mm. lot. So so so, so talk some more then about how that how Park Place progressed and what sort of customers you found and uh, you know what challenges you had then, because that is, that is a big shift right from from you know, a, a research comfy research lab to, to running the company. Yeah, it was, I'd, but but. 
um, as I listen to what I've told you about the story unfolding, because I've not done this before, um, I realize that a lot of what I was doing towards the end, or in the 80s, was trying to tie our work more and more to Xerox and mm. its business needs. Mm. And, and first and foremost, that's what you have to do. You have a product, you're I'm trying sure, to yeah. sell it. Yeah. And you need to understand your customer's business mm. and be able to uh, understand their problems and be able to explain how your problem solves mm. their problem. Mm. And, um, so it's I, going in that direction, clearly. Yeah. yeah right. And, I, and um, Jim Davis, who was the initial sales guy at Sun, was a, uh, uh, is a friend of mine. And he, he, um, he had said something uh, that really sort of changed my whole marketing aspect. Because what, what I thought was powerful, what I think is powerful about object technology is the extensibility, the flexibility of change, and the ability to predict what's affected by the change. Mm -hmm. So the entire reuse model, where you can essentially firewall and understand mm -hmm. what has to be retested, gives you some assurance um, and some predictability in making changes to large systems. Mm -hmm. And building systems that can change, whether they're for educational reasons or big financial you know, insurance companies, and investment bankers, banks, uh, Wall Street, w a lot of our customers, um, manufacturing operations, car companies, Chrysler, BMW, Mercedes. Um, regardless, they all have that as an issue. And, um, but what Jim said to me was, that won't work. And it's not working. And I said, why not? He said, their problem is they can't get the systems done in the first place. Mm. So they're not worrying about maintenance. They can't get to maintenance. So we had a switch, because it's a two-phase problem, sure, yeah, yeah. to yeah. rapid development. And, and that really builds on your libraries. Mm -hmm. As I watched in horror as our marketing people started counting the number of class definitions in our library and selling to quantity, which turned out to matter, but. Yeah, yeah sure, Th thud factor. Yes. But if you just want quantity, you could <laughs> build your libraries with quantity, that, that wasn't <laughs> the point, you know. But understandability. Sales. Sales. Yeah, yeah. But remember, these are the years where people were just learning to do graphical interfaces. Yeah. Hmm. And um, so as you watch and see what people do, we had two big issues the back end and the front end. <laughs> so you have this system, now you need to make it easy to construct the front end. And we had a good metaphor, a uh, good set of objects for doing that. And so we turned to graphical programming, graphical mm. construction kits to c create mm. your graphics. And that's when uh, the product, which was called ObjectWorks, which I remember hating when I first heard it and realizing now that Doug Pollock, who was the marketing sales guy at the time, was a genius. I mean, it's really a good name. Um, but they called it Visual Works because it allowed you mm -hmm. to create the, the, and that, boom, we took off. Because mm. you made the front end easy. Mm. The back end problem was database hookup. In research, we, we worried about database, but we worried more about um, object, objects, finding objects. Um, an object-oriented database. In fact, Bob Flagel worked a lot on that. And, um, but we didn't try to commercialize that. There were other companies mm. that were doing commercial yeah, yeah, right. object-oriented yeah, databases. Right. But if you're going to sell into legacy worlds, the thing they put the most design behind, the thing that the aspect of their systems that is the most critical is the design of their SQL mm. um, tables. And I know that from the last um, decade of work that I've done, which has mostly been dealing with exactly that problem. And we were fortunate that we had a, a vendor who sold the kit for hooking things up. Mm. And there were several, but we hadn't done that work mm. our, ourselves. Um, there was some ugly fighting going on too. You think you were in the kindergarten, not even a, not even in college. The fights between the structured programming methodologists and the object-oriented yeah. methodologists. Um, I finally realized that the structured guys thought we'd be putting them out of business, and that was one of the reasons for the unbelievable emotions, mm -hmm. um, terrible emotions. That was one. 
The other fight was, especially in the government sector, uh, I had somebody from one of the um, government contractors tell me I was awful, I was ruining their business. And I said, let me see if I can characterize your business for you. We were down in Florida, we were in the, um, in the behind the scenes at Disney World where there are conference sites and we were in the hallway and this guy says this to me and I said, here's what I think your business is. I think you pitch to the government a four year project with 400 people that you know that you'll be able to fund for four years and you underbid it and you have to get more money but they're four years in so they give you the fifth and the sixth. That's your business. He said that would be correct. I said that I'm going to ruin your business. Mm. And he came into the meeting arguing that you can't use an object-oriented approach because it means you're reusing. And if you're reusing, um, you're not meeting their requirement, this is intelligence community, to compartmentalize mm. where just the names of the objects were part of the secret. Oh boy. And fortunately, the man in charge, uh, one of the group chiefs said, well, we're just not going to do that anymore or we're alias it but we're going to reuse. We can't afford this any longer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, those are the kinds of things you learn about is, you know, when you have a customer issue going on. But um, the analyst workstation was a very important application, mm -hmm. spreadsheets and text editors that were being done. Um, one of the Wall Street guys built a whole framework for in which you could design financial instruments. Um, I know from those two cases alone, because I used to go, they're spending millions between software and training and uh, consultants helping them build. Um, I sure hope this is worth it to them. And every one of them told me, 10 minutes deployment, and they got back 10 times. Mm. Mm. You know, that was For part sure. of, you talk about learning, you know, millions mean nothing when what you're playing with is, is really a lot more, you know, what, what's at stake is a lot more. And some of it's qualitative. There was a conference on the West Coast that Steve Jobs gave a talk at. And um, he was pitching object technology and reuse. And it was funny because I had been behind the scenes excruciatingly, painfully teaching the uh, magazine guys like Business Week what, what the good examples were and what objects, because I couldn't afford to ha even though the article wasn't about us, I could not afford to have it be wrong. Yeah, right. right. And um, so Steve got up and he says, um, well, you wouldn't take an existing system, like you wouldn't take your existing payroll system and rewrite it all. I mean, that makes no sense. It's going forward with new things. And he gave his usual good fun talk. The next speaker was one of our customers from Chrysler. And he got up and he said, we are rewriting our payroll system. <laughs> and the reason? Inflexibility. Basically, you can watch the uh, Chrysler is probably one of many examples, having a bad relationship with the unions because the unions would make what on in some perspective were perfectly reasonable ch requests in terms of compensation mm. changes. And Chrysler would want to say yes, but they knew they couldn't do it because they couldn't implement it. Couldn't, yeah, they couldn't it. implement it. So what they wanted was to be able to say yes to the unions mm. by having a flexible, extensible mm. system. It was one of the best examples mm. I had ever heard. Mm. And that's what I meant by finding out what your stuff is good for, yeah, right? Yeah, Let your yeah. customers tell you, you know, type stuff. Um, so we were all learning. So in a sense, it was still a learning environment. And I think that's what sustained me, you know, through all that. Um, after Visual Works, then we took off enough four quarters of profitability, and we went public. Mm. Um, I'd hired somebody else to run the company. He and I didn't get along very well, um, so I left. Oh, then we merged with um, with one of our competitors with mm. Digitalk, and I could see the company was not was going in a direction that wasn't going to be fun for mm. me. Mm. Um, so it was time to leave. So, so how long were you? How long was Park Place for you? I think um, I think I stayed on the board until '95. Okay. Huh. And uh, um, and it was only a couple of years later that, very quickly, that they sold. Um, 
you know, for me, I learned a lot about board structures and how complicated it is in a venture-backed board when they wear multiple hats, they mm. won't take actions. Um, you know, there were a lot of issues there. And I've been fortunate, I've brought that to other companies where I've mm. been on the boards mm. now and, and uh, kind of learned a bit about the role of a board member. And I don't like it when, um, other than the CEO, there are inside people on the board. I think that that's, that's an extra hat. Yeah. Venture guy's got his partners as well as the company. Those are two hats. I think that's complicated. Because yeah. you always have to figure out what are they worrying about, what's, mm. what's going on. So then, then what was next after that? Well then, Mitsubishi, which was one of our cu customers, um, through Mitsubishi Research, well, Mitsubishi in Japan, but Mitsubishi Research in, uh, in um, Boston area, um, got interested in the virtual community problem mm -hmm. in Essentially, one of the big outcomes of doing Park Place, which, which could have been, which I think was a bit of an error on our part not to understand, which is when you are in research or you're thinking about onesies, the nature of the programming situation is clearly different than when you have a team. Mm. And two people can do fine. When you get to three, then you have code management problems and you have, um, you just have coordination problems. Sure, yeah. um, and that's true in software. Um, there, was a v there were good solutions in the small talk world done by another company, NV was an example. Um, and then we were doing our own in-house work funded by some of our customers because the NV approach was one particular style and we had some other ideas. Um, but but if you I I extrapolate from that and look at it more broadly, that particular problem, which is it doesn't matter how clever your language is, it doesn't matter how, what your libraries are like, it doesn't matter whether your visual construction tools are like, in the end there's going to be a team, they're going to need to collaborate, they need to have a shared vision. I had written a book with, done some studies and written a book with um, Kenny Rubin on specifically this problem. We got the book right, but we got it in the wrong order in terms of what you do, but that's part of the learning. And, um, and, and so it was like we wanted to understand, well, it's hard enough when they're all in the same building. What happens when they're in different cities? Yeah, yeah. And that's very costly. And we had learned a bit of the Xerox experience that you really can tie people mm -hmm. together in multiple cities in a way that felt fairly mm -hmm. close. Um, and and have a sense of team. There were some tricks to it, but you could do it. So um, Mitsubishi was more about manufacturing engineering development. They were interested in the problem. So they offered to fund, I think we got like four million dollars mm. from them, to do a multi-year research project. Mm. And so we actually built one of the, uh, designed and built one of the very early online project management mm. Um, a little bit too researchy, a little too clever, mm. you know, from what uh, what was ultimately commercialized. Um, but when we finished it, I said, I can't do this again because there isn't a waiting customer. It's not a pull market. It's a push like it was for object technology. Mm. It's too much marketing. We're too early again. Mm. And I just didn't want to, um, to make that into mm. a company. And I had at the same time concluded that the primary interests in these kinds of systems were going to be, um, if it wasn't just lists of things that were being checked off, but serious collaboration, going to work best in worlds where there's um, compliance obligations. Mm. So um, the reason is that you're asking people today to spend time, almost anally, logging, interacting. I mean, obviously you can use the tricks we have now, everyone does, with discussions. They're not online, they're online discussion forums, but you get them email. Yeah, right. And they get archived, and that facilitates it because, mm. because our generation is used to email. You know, the current generation, they Twitter, so even, <laughs> it wouldn't work even for them. But, um, and it's amazing, they can say so little in such a short, <laughs> yeah, they can say so much in such a little bit of space. But, um, 
I, I, um, I just didn't want to push that up. And the compliance systems were more waste management and mm. pharmaceuticals. Mm. And I had met uh, mm. somebody in the pharmaceutical who started teaching me about it. So I've actually, for the last decade, been working with that same person um, and ended up uh, working with a private equity fund in drug development, yeah. building some of the um, initial systems, yeah. learning. It's, it's like a new career, learning all about how drugs are developed. Yeah. And, that, and I'm enjoying that. Hmm. Cool. Uh, anything we haven't covered that should have been? Because you've done a lot of different stuff. Um, well, you know, I suppose if you were Alan Kay sitting there, you would be shaking your finger and said, what happened to your interest in education? Um, and um, so I, I've tried a couple things. I got involved with a company that was doing mostly CDs, um, very high quality, and, um, and it didn't make it. It was, um, it was like too late, too late for CDs, CDs and too early for the online mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and, but the same, but the um, executives there started, got funded for and started a new company um, to do online and I understood that what they were trying to do was build community amongst mm -hmm. teachers and I was interested in that. So um, I was their initial CTO mm -hmm. development manager and ended up being there for four years um, building Becoming a Python programmer, so oh, yeah, programmer. Okay, that was the Python. Thing. That was That's the Python, so and just as lovely, you know. I was really very happy with the system. Um, I had you have to get your head around it, but once you do, um, you know, you you can build a lot fast. And I swear it was we we had very little time, counted months, less than a year, to build an authoring environment using XML. Um, which got pre-processed to generate the HTML, I use Smalltalk for that, and then a, uh, a learning deployment mm -hmm. system. And um, spent a lot of time, mostly in Texas, in the schools down there. And, um, but in the end, what we didn't really do teacher community, the politics, I kept being told the, t the politics don't allow it. Mm. The, there were a lot of those reasons. Mm. And I don't, I'm not convinced, the New York Times has a new project in this area, and they seem to be going after what I'd hoped for. A no, number of years have passed since. Um, but we ended up doing more um, electronic books online. Mm. And I think they, they're effective as classroom aids to the teachers, but they're really not for the kids and they're mm. not for the teachers mm. to help one another. Um, so after four years, um, it was stable enough I left because it was, they needed to rebuild everything. Um, so, it, so I moved on from that. Um, and then, you know, I started thinking about what else would you do and how would you do it? You know, and I looked at the uh, one laptop per child activities mm -hmm. and I talked to Alan, but um, I haven't found the right thing in education mm -hmm. to go back to. I've talked with a number of people where the problem, I think I've mentioned to you before is, I can't get my head around a curriculum that says you're, you're a kindergartner, what should you do with computing that would lead you by high school to be an if able to use computers effectively mm. as a thinking partner? Mm. The way we know about uh, how, to, how, to, um, how to order our, our reading and mm. our math mm. introductions. Um, I've spent some time on it, but I, I don't think I have a, a good solution yet. I'd like to because I have grandkids and I'd, oh, like yes, to get so, them, yes. I'd like to get them started, mm, mm. but I um, haven't, haven't figured that out yet. So I mostly sit on Skype with my six-year-old granddaughter and I give her word problems rather than just, you know, I give her three plus two, um, but it's more fun to just say, to give her candy <laughs> that, and divide the candy amongst her friends and that she likes better. <laughs> so it's fun. Okay, so let's, let's start with, tell us a little bit about doing systems research in the 70s at Park. What was that like? So to talk about 70s at Park, I have to back up a bit and just know what had I done before that. So I had been working in more traditional 
um, systems building on an IBM 360 or an IBM 704 at the University of Chicago. We were actually building our own machine. Very traditional, time-shared, multi-user type environments. Um, and then I went to Stanford and we were building um, applications that assisted children in learning math, mostly math. I was involved in teaching elementary level and college level symbolic logic. Again, PDP-10, big timeshare system, had to work at night, all night long, because the kids were on during the day. Obviously, the dream at Xerox Park, and the reason I went there, was to give more ownership of systems to the users and we we're interested both in kids and as well as adults. So the idea that um, there was all the power of that machine was going to go to one person and you could think about it that way rather than spending all your time being practical about time and space changed everything. Just your whole approach to what you were doing. Secondly, I was used to funded projects, mostly NSF fun funded projects. When you do funded projects, you've done a lot of it beforehand, and you have to get it done, you have to get it done under the grant, and you have to get more done so you can get your next grant, and so you're always watching what are you going to publish, what grant. And Xerox was such a gift, you know, you had, we, we estimated you had about five years of real exploration, real prototyping, really do something, learn from it, throw it away, and start over again. And so that was really very special, very different from university or, or um, mostly university experience that I'd had before that. So, so you, of course, are a software person, not a hardware person Correct. particularly. Uh, so, but tell us a little bit about the Alto and when that came and what that meant for you folks. So by the time I got to Xerox Park, there was, um, there was an, a first Alto. But if I recall, the display screen was covered with cardboard. It really wasn't a finished product in any sense. Um, and we thought of it as an interim Dynabook. So obviously I went to Xerox to work on the Dynabook project where we miscalculated. We thought we had about five years of hardware development before everyone would carry high-powered <laughs> computers powerful as the PDP-10, wherever they went. And so, of course, we underestimated the power of what you'd have, and we certainly underestimated the timing. Um, and we, so we viewed it as primarily a software problem. And we treated the Alto as a, an environment in which to explore what that handheld computer would be all about. We had only a few of them. And, and they were built, designed and built um, in the computer science lab with Butler Lampson, Chuck Thacker in the lead. Obviously, Alan Kay was very involved in specking out, and I think in providing some of the funding. But, um, and my responsibility was really at the user level. What are people going to do with the Dynabook? In that case, what were they going to do with the Alto? And, and so, so that's yeah. where, is that where the small talk work came from? So, right. So. Since we assumed the hardware problem would be solved, although we didn't quite assume without some serious nudging that the flat panel display would be solved, and we were involved with um, uh, Ann Chang, for example, in one of the other laboratories who was interested in exploring technologies for flat panel displays. But basically, we saw it as a software problem. And we saw it as a software problem for how, how can you enable the average person to use a computer to communicate, to communicate with themselves as well as others. Communicating included computing. Um, if you're going to do computing and you're going to own it and make it yourself, uh, we believed it meant that at some level you were going to program. So it came down to coming up with a software idea um, and a software approach that allowed you to program at all levels of the machine and that what the professional programmers, systems programmers did could be exposed at some point to those who were more interested in what they were doing than what they were programming. So you wanted some uniformity at all levels. And so when we say small talk, we mean the language of the Dynabook. Um, and it had many, many iterations through the years. The very first small talk in 1971. Uh, when I got to Xerox, the small talk 72 was already started because uh, I got there in 1973. And every two years, we did, every 
two year, every four years a new implementation, and then the alternative two years um, we did a new um, a new language simulated a new language on that implementation. So there were many many v versions of Smalltalk until 1980, at uh, which point we we felt that we needed to share what we were doing with the world a at a little larger and get some help with what was turning out to be a very hard problem. Well, so this is all old stuff for you, uh, but um, uh, as I recall, some, some interesting new things really got going in that environment in terms of user interface. You know, it's, it's really interesting because so much of what was done, we almost took for granted that there was no other way. And I think um, at some point you get so in the middle of your, what you're doing, what your research is, that you forget it isn't what everybody else is doing. Uh, I had been on graphical displays on, a, uh, on an IMLAC display on the PDP-10 and an IBM 1500. We had done graphical uh, interactive systems, but not with the flexibility of a bitmap display. So amongst the things that I think were very innovative was um, not just that we did it, but how we did overlapping windows. And so the problem being solved is no matter how big the display is, it's too small. How, how can you make it bigger? And the second problem is no matter how much you try to make the system uniform, consistent, simple to use, um, you're going, if you're programming, you're going to have to find out how to do things. So the entire user interface metaphor was about search, and that's where the browsers came from, which is you know searching for code, searching for relationships amongst um, the parts of the code, Smalltalk is an object-oriented system, so code is organized in terms of objects that own their own data, and you have to ask the objects what to do by sending them a message. So a lot of the uh, query interface uh, was, was very much about who's doing what, who knows how to do what, who can I send this message to to get something to happen. Um, another thing we did I think was fascinating was a running system as it's running, you can interrupt it and say, who's doing that? Now, I say who when I really mean what. I mean what object in the system is doing that. But it allows you when you know nothing about the system and how it's really put together, it allows you to see things that you're interested in and be able to find out how it was put together. And the third thing that I think was innovative was the approach we took to multimedia. Um, if you're going to communicate, you're going to communicate with text, you're going to communicate with static pictures, there's going to be animation, um, there's going to be executable code, and they're not going to be independent. They're going to be very well integrated. And one of the loveliest um, inventions, which I think comes first from Larry Tesler and followed on by Diana Mary, was to be able to have a document showing all aspects of that, those different kinds of media, and it's by touching it, an editor would come up and you could change it in place, rather than taking the approach of opening an application, copying things in, making the change. So it was, it was a smoother way of interacting with the system. So, so a lot of folks have used the term WIMP. Or, uh, 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 did you folks ever actually use that for window icon uh, mouse pointers? We didn't talk. We, we didn't talk that way. No. Okay. I mean, I, I you just did it. You didn't talk that way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we were obviously doing that, and we were doing it um, with music. We were doing it with animation. Um, we were, and we were very interested in how to sync them and how, and how young children could um, could manipulate the information behind um, music and behind animation. But um, we didn't we we didn't coin or use that terminology. Okay, okay but how about in terms of influence? Uh, perhaps talk a little bit about looking back now the influence of the work on the Alto on um, on the current uh, uh, ed ed evolution of personal computers. Um, so there's a hardware influence and there's a software influence. And the software obviously is programming language as well as applications. Um, I'll start with the hardware. Um, if you f look at the chronology of, system, uh, of hardware that was built from the very first Alto, and Xerox was very public about what it did. We had visitors all the time. Sometimes we didn't even realize a person was a visitor because they were escorted by some other Xerox employee and, 
and, um, and I don't always know the rules on how people entered the building. Um, but clearly there was an influence um, into Carnegie Mellon and into the PERC computer that came out later. Uh, our own work influenced Tektronics when the 4400 came out. Um, they even put a small talk system in their oscilloscope, which is an interesting idea in terms of embedded systems. Um, and, and of course there's the infamous argument about who was stealing what from whom in terms of my Microsoft and Apple. Um, Apple, from a hardware point of view, um, clearly along that chronology, you see the Lisa and you see the Mac. And I would hope that, I mean, it was clear that the Alto, which then um, progressed into what we used to call the D machines, so the, um, the Dolphin, the Dorado, and the Dandelion, which were all, the Dandelion was a commercial machine out of the Xerox Systems Group. Um, they were obviously um, flowing from the ancestor of, of the Alto itself with the same people involved in, in the design. So I think that's, that's the hardware one. It was, it was the granddaddy of powerful individual p workstation that um, I used to say to the students, the, the kids I taught, mostly junior high school, who'd come in to park for our resource center and we eventually took Altos to Jordan Junior High School um, to see what the kids could do with the combination, I'd say to them, um, the only person you hurt by trying to break the machine is yourself, so go ahead. <laughs> That's my bad. In terms of the programming languages, uh, Smalltalk is derived from uh, Simula. Um, there are a number of other languages that influence taking a message sending approach to objects, but um, and, then, and then obviously Smalltalk um, as a programming environment in terms of how you program, not just the, the syntax or semantics of the language, influenced um, the interfaces to Lisp and to Mesa. Uh, I, I would believe that that would that be considered accurate. Um, and, um, and then there was Objective-C and C++ and, and uh, Python and a number of other um, mod modular Pascal, you know, that that we all learned from Simula and derived down. And, and what we learned from Simula, Simula, Simula <laughs> primarily is that it's a simulation language. The purpose of that language was to enable people to simulate the world as they understood it so they'd understand it better or verify their understanding. And that's what we were doing in the uh, small talk world was trying to make sure that people could um, build applications that in some way represented their understanding how some aspect of the world worked and that was a big part of the commercialization of small talk which was for businesses to simulate their business process and be able to step in and, and assist in those processes. So I've, I've been using some words and um, including small talk and objects and message sending that um, perhaps aren't broadly um, known. Most, most computer programmers today now know what they are, but certainly in the 70s and in the 80s when we commercialized the language, a big part of what we had to do was educate. Um, so small talk is we call it a programming system. It's a language, and the language, all languages evolve over the years, but they mostly evolve now because there are libraries that you can use. Um, but it's basically a language that is made up of um, objects, which you can think of as simulations of a computer. And a computer has data and it has uh, operations on that data, so every object is a way of representing the data to carry out the operations. So if I were simulating a um, business process, for, for example, in a financial institution, I might represent the various kinds of financial instruments I have and um, the flow of buying and selling um, those instruments, I would include customer and customer accounts and, um, and how we would report on them. And all of the key, key players or actors in that world would be represented by an object. Okay, so what are you working on now? What are you, what are you excited about? So I have, I have a, a sort of a general area that I work on which I think of as creating virtual communities, building communities online. Actually that work started in 1984. 
um, once we had finished a lot of the small talk uh, work and got it out the door, um, that was personal computing. And we started realizing that the problem we'd actually posed for ourselves was interpersonal. Mm -hmm. How do people communicate with one another? How do they um, share their interests? How do they help uh, coordinate with one another when you're working remotely? And, and the end of um, of the 1990s, we formed a company that got funded to start researching that particular problem. And it was focused on primarily engineers. But it's evolved now so that the two large projects I'm currently working on um, have to do with helping international researchers find one another and collaborate um, over a distance, share their resources, hold their conversations. Um, and the other area which is, I think, the one that is the most exciting, is in drug development. I work with a group of people who are very interested in how you can run a virtual company, a small virtual company that takes early stage assets, molecules, and um, takes them through the preclinical stage to proof of concept. And trying to do that, where you only have 20 people, but you have 20 or 25 drugs, mm -hmm. means that technology must enable mm -hmm. you. So, so then that sort of leads to the next one is what do, you, what do you think the next big challenge is for the computing industry and computing in general? Right, so be, besides, the, besides the interest in the virtual communities, one particular virtual community I've worked in is helping teachers help one another wherever they are. So I still have an interest in mm -hmm. educational um, uses. So, so the two big areas that I really want to see technology uh, focused on is healthcare and the personalization or customization of healthcare and doing a much better job in the education of our children. Hmm. Um, actually, lifelong, lifelong education, hmm. not just our children, because once you've learned and learned how to, to learn on your own and find other people to learn with, that becomes a lifetime. So, so how do you think uh, technology jobs will change in the future? It's a lot more present, ever present than it used to be. Um, that, that's a hard question because, of course, it, it ties to what do technologists do all day. I had at some point scoped out a book for children that was going to be called What Do Computer People Do All Day? A Scary Story. And, it, and, and to some extent, for most people, it's still scary. They don't really understand what you're trying to do. We invent languages for specific areas. We invent languages that let us simulate other languages so that we can allow people who are experts in businesses do their own programming. And one of our goals in the 70s, which I think has happened, not as much as we'd like to see, but has happened more and more through the 80s and 90s and now into the 21st century, is that most people feel empowered to change the computer. But the way they do it is still cumbersome. They still have to learn what computer scientists have to learn. If you're going to teach a child in school, you're still going to, and you're going to give them a test and see if they understand about a computer, we still think of it as teaching them a programming language. And then we argue over which programming language. And that's not a conceptual way to teach. Um, so I, I think one of the things that has to happen, whether it will or not, we'll see, is that we have to understand more and more what it is a kindergartner learns about a computer, what a first grader learns, what a second grader learns. The same way we think about teaching them to read and write, teaching them um, mathematics by starting out with simple concepts and building up, and not over expecting what they know so that, so that it becomes a natural tool. When we look around in the consumer world, we see everybody with their phones. They see, we see everyone playing with media. I have grandchildren ages six and down, and they all know how to call me up on Skype and do their homework on Skype, and it's all very natural communication channels. Um, but but they don't know how to do is to take that computer and mold it to their own mm -hmm. ideas, the way they do with crayons and pencils on a piece of paper. So we still have that as a challenge. So if kids get a good education in this, and they decide they want to go into a technology a career, uh, what sort of advice do you have for them about what they what they might ought to think of doing and, and how they ought to prepare for it? Well, I know what I tell them today. Um, even those who are more mathematicians and who want to do more theory, 
that there's two things they absolutely have to focus on if they want to go into computer technology as an academic pursuit, whether they then stay in academia or go into the commercial sector. One is mathematics, mathematics, and mathematics. I mean, we've lost that. We all started as doing math. Um, we may have done it through a physics or um, uh, chemistry sequence, but, but when I went through um, school, undergraduate and graduate school, mathematics was at the core. That is not the case if you look at most computer curriculums. And secondly, you have to have something else you know about. It's an application. Um, and the one I would choose if I were um, back in school is I would learn more about uh, biology. Because again, I think the, one of the biggest problems facing us in this world is healthcare and understanding the science behind our health problems or health opportunities is critical. So being able to apply the computational sciences to um, healthcare is critical.